Dear friends, good day and welcome to the third episode of our Learning Bach series. Today we're going to take a look at the third movement of this marvelous work by Bach, the Capriccio sopra la lontananza del suo fratello dilettissimo. So far we have learned that the Capriccio is made up of six movements, the first four of which have some very precise instruction by Bach as to what the music is supposed to represent. The third movement is supposed to be a general lament of his friends and bears the rather strange tempo indication adagio sissimo, as adagio as possible, which indeed is very, very slowly. Now, this is a very important movement of the capriccio, but it's also the most problematic because it has several passages in which Bach prescribed the basso continuo, and the basso continuo is a little bit of a lost art and I would like to talk somewhat in detail about it because it is quite interesting. Probably in order to best illustrate the difference between what the music sounds like without the basso continuo and with the basso continuo, the best thing to do would be for me to play you the music exactly as it appears. Now I am very happy to report that this channel has a very varied audience. Uh, there are some music professionals that follow me, pianists, uh, harpsichordists, violinists, composers, but there's a, also a lot of people who are music lovers without a musical education. Therefore, if you are a professional or if you know uh, already the piece, I've indexed in the description uh, the various topics of this episode, so feel free to skip ahead. But if you don't know the Capriccio, perhaps you want to bear with me as I play for you the third movement without any basso continuo realization. <laughs>
there's no denying that this is his lament. There's also no denying that there is some very beautiful music in this lament. However, if I replay it like I just did for Mr. Bach himself, he probably would have treated me very badly because what I did is not even half the work that he prescribed. Earlier I mentioned basso continuo. So what is basso continuo? Or rather, what was basso continuo? Because I'm pretty sure nowadays nobody uses it anymore. Well, basso continuo was really two things at the same time. First of all, it was a kind of shorthand by which the composer would tell the interpreters how to realize the harmony over a given bass. And he would do that through some little numbers, and we'll get to that in a minute. But basso continuo was also an invitation to the performer to improvise a little bit over this certain harmony. Bear in mind, many people have written extraordinary treatises about the art of basso continuo. One of the most famous in Italian is Gasparini, but there is also, I don't know, Pasquini, Muffa, Matheson, Dandrie, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a huge literature, not always concordant, but that is another point. Now, let's try and see how we can do, well, realize this basso continuo, and we start from the very basic. I have transcribed on a piece of music paper the bass line of the first four bars with the numbers that Bach gave us, and let me play it for you again. see that on top of the first note, which is an F, Bach wrote a 5. Now, this number 5 indicates the fifth note above the F. So if we count them, F is 1, G would be 2, A would be 3, B would be 4, and finally C would be 5. Therefore, we need to play a fifth at the beginning. Now, to make things a little bit clearer, I'm going to play the right hand an octave above. So the first chord is going to be this. Reading on, Bach places the number six with a flat sign. So obviously he wants us to go from the fifth to the sixth, but flat enough at all. That would be a D flat. It would sound like this. There's nothing on the third beat, but then at the beginning of the second bar, Bach goes down to an E natural and puts there the number seven flat. Now, we don't need to count all the notes again, but the seven note from an E is D, flattened is D flat. Therefore, it would be this. seven flat we need to go down to six to the sixth which still on the E note is C it sounds like this if we put it together this is what we get and the next bar the bass note is an F with the 9 signed over it. So Bach wants us to put a G on top of that F. Quite interesting dissonance. Therefore, reading through on the fourth bar, there is a low C with the number 4, which of course is the fourth being an F. And going down to the 3. Put it all together. In my 
opinion, it is already much more interesting than the bare base line that Bach notated. However, this is still not enough because Basso continue to prescribe a certain knowledge of harmony. Now, this piece is written in the key of F minor, and therefore we need to start with the harmony of F minor. Now, I'm going to play this little phrase again with the harmonies filled in. That is already much better, I think, but to me it feels very square, very strict. And therefore, we can try a couple of little tricks to make it more flowing. For instance, given the tone of the piece, very solemn and very sad, I think that the very first note in the bass should sound alone, and the harmony come on the second note, something similar to this. If I sort of repeat the, each harmony on every beat, I think we get even a more interesting solution. This is the general idea, but it's usually still not enough. Because you see, this was very cordial, again, very regimental, was better than before, but it's still very, very strict. When we realize the basso continuum, it's always worth to bear in mind in which context we are going to play this basso continuum. Often, the basso continuum was used to accompany other singers or other instrumentalists, in which case, the keyboardist would be rather discreet. However, when he was present in solo music, as I said earlier, it was a little bit of the excuse or a bit of improvisation. Now, in this adagio sissimo, of course, the tone of the music is such that we want to keep our basso continuo very discreet. However, I see no reason why our own realization of the Bach's harmony should not try a much tone of the piece itself, and perhaps even the melody by Mr. Bach itself. Now, a real continual player could probably do all of this at sight. However, I am not a real continual player. I'm not even a composer. Therefore, I wrote down my realization of this basso continuo, and I would like to take you through it. I want to show you why I made certain decision versus others. For instance, at the beginning, I decided to arpeggiate the harmony. And therefore, my beginning is going to sound like this. It's played here. At this point, the melody that Bach wrote begins, and here we have two choices. Either we can play it as he wrote it, without filling in the harmony, but I very much suspect that it would be a mistake, because by the mere fact that Bach gave us the basso continuo for the first four bars, I very much believe that he intended for us to fill in the remainder of the harmony as things progress. So of course, as I said, we're going to do it very discreetly in the background because the most important things are the notes that Bach wrote, the bass and the melody. Therefore, it will sound something similar to this.
Stop right there because when Baroque composers wrote pieces as low as this and started to write certain wide intervals, often they intended for the player to fill in some of the intervals as well as some of the harmonies. For instance, I think that a few notes here and there in the melody would be justified. Something like this. Perhaps not to everybody's liking, but it could be justified to do something similar. Also, by this point, we see that the melody, so to speak, goes into the left hand, so we need to fill in the harmony on the right, something like this. By bar 25, we again encounter the basso continuo fitted given to us by Mr. Bach. He only writes the bass line, which is very beautiful actually, very open. passage happens at a very pivotal moment of the piece. There has been a lot of tension mounting and therefore I'm going to realize the harmony in quite a powerful way that may underline the importance of the moment. I'm thinking of something like this. bars later there is another very beautiful passage in which the hands are engaged in a dialogue. It sounds like this. Now it is worth noticing that this is one of the very few places in which Bach gives us uh, an articulation or rather phrasing sound. He wants the falling notes to be legato and this undoubtedly needs an emphasis on the lamentous quality of this movement. <laughs> Beautiful. 
possible indeed. But I believe that if we insert a third little voice filling in the middle, we may get not only a fuller impression for this music, but we can help it in reaching its natural goal, which will happen a few bars later, growing in intensity and pathos. I'm thinking of something like this. is over. There are four bars of a sort of meandering cadenza during which the music peters out to nothing, befitting very much the style of a lamento. Now, at this point, I think the best thing for me to do is to play the whole piece for you, the whole adagio sissimo, with my realization of the basso continuo. Indeed, I hope that you're going to like it. And on that note, thank you so very much for bearing with me during this long episode, and indeed, see you next time. Buon ascolto.